This is a song uh, written by Luca Bloom, one of Ireland's great modern songwriters. And it talks a little bit about the, uh, the immigration following the famine years of the 1840s. And it talks about the diaspora of the Irish traveling across America. It's a lovely song called The City of Chicago. In the city of Chicago, as the evening shadows fall, there are people dreaming of the hills of Teddy Gold. 1847 was the year which all began. Deadly pains of hunger from a million from the land. Across the stormy seas to the city of Chicago, as the evening shadows fall, there are people dreaming of the hills of Tuddy Gall. Some of them new fortune. This is Creative Current. I'm Kelvin Han Yi right here on LAArtStream.com, and you were just listening to Ken O'Malley. Uh, we are going to be talking about 800 years of Irish struggle. We are going to be talking about the Irish diaspora tonight. We are going to be talking about the Irish imprint on the American soul, especially through music. And we're going to be talking to the wonderful Ken O'Malley. Ken, welcome to Creative Current. Thanks, Kelvin. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be uh, to, to see you here. I, I've been listening to your music in my car and uh, on my iPhone and, and, and all of that while I'm running in the morning. And uh, your, your music really moves me and it, it really touches me in a very special, personal way. Uh, I think there's a, combination, a commonality in immigrant experience between the Irish and the Chinese, you know, and a lot of your music has has it talks about the Irish, uh, the Irish immigrant experience. Oh, um, absolutely. I mean, there's a great body of our material deals with immigration. I mean, sure, sure. Going back to even the pre-famine era of the 1840s, you know, the the, the Scots Irish from the north of Ireland started coming here in the almost as early as the early 1600s. Sure. And on and on then into the 1700s. But the, the vast majority of Irish came here in the early 1800s and then with the famine years of the 1840s, what they call on Gertha Moor or the Gaelic for the Great Hunger, uh -huh. where a million people died in Ireland with the loss of the potato, the potato famine. Right. And a million and a half people emigrated and most of them came here to America. Sure, sure. Now, uh, uh, certainly uh, economic hardship, uh, but also political 
strife oh, yes. uh, also caused uh, the great diaspora of, of, of yes. Irish uh, uh, to this country, right? Um, remind us a little bit about uh, about the the political environment that uh, uh, well Ireland has 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 been under for for 800 years uh, until just recently. Yeah. Well, I mean, originally the Normans came um, at the behest of Henry II, the King of England, in the right. early 11th century. Uh, they never left. Basically, that's what happened. They right, never right, left. Right. And uh, throughout those years, even at a time up to the first several hundred years, the only control that the English had was in this small area around Dublin called the Pale. You've heard that expression, yes. beyond the pale. Beyond the pale. The Is pale, that where that comes from? Yes. The pale right. was an area roughly 30 miles outside of the city in a semicircle. And beyond that, the English were terrified to go out there. there so many of the Irish clans, the tribes, sure. etc. But uh, nevertheless, they controlled as very much they did with the Scots. The Irish were an, um, a body of clans, tribes. Right. And they had no central government at that point, and uh, very similar to the Scots. So the British, who had a, a parliament and a monarch, etc., divided, divided and conquered Absolutely. the Irish. Absolutely. And even from that small area, were able to do that. And up through about the uh, end of the 16th century, uh, the old Gaelic era was over at the defeat of... King or uh, Ireland's chieftains Hugh O'Neill and Hugh O'Donnell at the Battle of Kinsale in Cork, when Spain had sent over several hundred Spanish soldiers to aid them in a rebellion against the English and could have actually pushed them out. Mm -hmm. But as luck would have it, as whatever the hand of God was that day, the Irish lost the battle and that was the end of the old Gaelic era. After that, the English really put their foot down on the Irish. Sure. And it never changed for about another 400 years. Now we're talking about this uh, because Ken O'Malley is um, he is a a, a troubadour, yes. uh, as it were. You are uh, uh, you make uh, you make your life uh, singing songs. Yes, sir. Uh, some mm -hmm. some of them other people's songs. Some yeah. of them your own. Yes. Uh, you sing traditional Irish music. Yes, I do. Right, and you sing in Gaelic yeah. sometimes. I do. Right. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we're we're talking about the history of of, of Ireland because. Uh, so much of the history of Ireland is, uh, can be found in the music, the mu the Irish, the Scots Irish music. I, I I kind of hesitate in talking to you to put those two together, but uh, the Scots Irish uh, lineage of music certainly has um, uh, has its imprint on American music. It's it's what country music is, right? You've uh, hit you've hit it right on the nail. Right, and and uh, uh, in actual fact, the way I understand it is when the Scots-Irish came to this country in the 1700s, right. a lot of them went to the south, the southern states, the plantations. Sure. They had money. They brought the music that we would believe today to be bluegrass. Right. You know, there's a, there's a theory which I don't think is entirely accurate. It's um, when King William won the Battle of the Boyne, which created the orange and the green. Right, right. Now, Protestant and what, Catholic. Yeah, and what year is this? Uh, 1689. Right, right. And it was right after that that the Scots-Irish pretty much came to America. Right. And uh, they brought the music with them as well. But it was, that was, um, the, the, you can talk about hillbillies. Well, the, 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 Sometimes there's where a, that there's word a comes connection from, right? between Billy. King William, Billy, Billy. exactly. Yeah. There are a lot of people say that, that there's no connection at all. Whatever you oh, want, anyway you want to look yeah, at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that, I think that what you, uh, uh, whether you want to say uh, the, 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 that it, the, that it's in the language, uh, you can hear it in the music. Yes, it's just undeniable. Uh, it, it's the same chords. It's when you the think same... of when you think of square dancing, yeah, it's all right? comes from traditional Irish set dancing. Sure, 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 and clogging and Clog things like exactly. that. Exactly, it's stuff. all Irish. It's it, all Irish, right? and the fiddle tunes, and a lot of yeah. a, a lot of people don't realize too that. A lot of the cowboy songs go back to Ireland, where a lot of the Irish came in through Galveston in uh -huh, Texas uh -huh, uh -huh. and became cowboys. All they had to do was learn how to ride horses. Right. But when they used right. to settle down the herds at night, they would sing these old Irish, what they call camalias, 
laments, airs, and literally would this quiet sort of, down the animals. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, so it's that tradition of, of singing to, to cows. Absolutely. Right? Singing to your animals. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, tell me about some songs that maybe uh, that, 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 that maybe are like that. Okay, I'll give uh, you a great example would be yeah. um, the bold Phelan Brady, the bard of Armagh, oh. became the streets of Laredo. It's the exact it's the same, same melody. It's the same song. Exact same. No kidding. Uh, you also uh, uh, you you you, all, you also uh, sing some um, other traditional sort of Irish songs that have history in them. Uh, oh yeah. Share some of that with us. Um, um, for, for instance, uh, I, I you have somebody in your own family history, Grace Grace O'Malley. Grace O'Malley, yes, right, yes, right, yes. right. Grainne Wales, she was known as in Gaelic. Tell us about this woman. Okay. And this is actually a person, a woman that's in your... Well, I mean, family. I'm an O'Malley. So a, we right. both came from the very same part of Ireland, a little town of Westport, County Mayo, which is on Clue Bay, which is one of the larger bays in Ireland. And what was different about her was at a time when a woman could never be the leader of a clan. Sure. She inherited the ability to foresee the weather. We were a very seafaring family. Yeah. The O'Malley's literally ruled the west coast and southwest coast of Ireland with their ships and their... The clan. Yes, the clan, the clan did. Right. And they ferried, they ferried um, Scottish mercenaries all the way over around the north of Ireland uh, who would come in and fight in inter-tribal, inter-clan wars. Uh -huh. they, <clears throat> they would have traded uh, skins, pelts, fish, salted fish, uh, with places as far flung as Spain, Portugal, France, sure. and bring back silks, wines, ports, liquors, fine clothing. The O'Malley's traded everywhere. So they were a fine, powerful uh, seafaring family. Yeah, must have but been she, wealthy and... Yes. Yeah. As she was a young girl, she actually loved the sea so much that she actually got her father to take her to France when she was about nine years old. And, but she learned all the sea lanes and the reefs and all the channels and the weather from her father. So her brother, who was Donal of the Pipes, he liked to play the Irish Pipes. Sure. He was much more of an agrarian type. He liked to look after the cattle herds. And in those days, Ireland's wealth was in their cattle. Sure. They didn't have money. Right, right, right. Or they might have had gold. Your but holding was, was in... Your, livestock. Your livestock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So he preferred that. She took over the leadership of the fleet. And she was one heck of a woman in terms of uh, she was, she gave birth at sea at one point to her youngest son during a battle against Turkish pirates. And this is no fable. This is a true story. What a story. The child was just born. They were losing the battle on deck. Yeah. And she threw a sheet around her and grabbed a blunderbuss from yeah, the yeah. wall of her cabin. Uh, one of those old, old pistols with gun. the... Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And went on deck, and everybody stopped. They saw this woman clothed in a sheet of blood-drenched... Uh, uh, birth blood. And they stopped, stared. She shot the Turkish captain, rallied her men, defeated the Turks, took their ships, threw them overboard. That is historical. That's real. That's the real that's yeah. the real deal. And when she was suffering so much, she'd been in prison for a year by the English. Yeah. She had one of her sons was uh was um executed by them in sure. cold blood. Sure. She actually sued Queen Elizabeth the first. Sued. In terms of she wanted to get more of a freedom for herself and her people. Yeah. She went to London on one of her ships with Scots mercenaries to protect her sure. and had an audience with Queen Elizabeth. And, and, was, and that was unknown, unheard of, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. with a woman at and, the time, in those days. And, 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 uh, and she got a pension for life. Oh, really? She was given the word that these wolves would be taken off her back, so to speak, these sheriffs in the west of Ireland that were English. Right. And, um, I mean, it was all about, in those days particularly, what the English also re relied upon was that the tribes would go for whatever they thought was the best bet, the allegiances. Uh -huh. If they thought their best shot was to stay on the English side, they'd go there. So the English sure. worked that out. 
yeah, yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. espionage going on right, in those right, days, right, yeah, yeah. a lot of clandestine operations, right, and yeah. money was being passed. Oh, it was an awful shambles. Oh, I bet. Mm. I bet. What, what an interesting time in, in, it, in Irish history. Fabulous time. And now, yeah. you, you, uh, you and your band, uh, the, put Twilight Lords. the Twilight Lords, put together uh, an album. Uh, and, and you've got some music. Uh, you, well, we you've have got several ones. albums, actually. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah, but yeah. but that, that particular album, you have a song about. Yes, so there's a song about, uh, it's called The White Seahorse, yeah, yeah. which is the name, actually that. the title of our first album. And The White Seahorse was the white seahorse on a royal blue background was the flag of the O'Malley's. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's just it? fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Uh, and uh, you, now, you have some other songs uh, that are about um, Irish rebellion. Uh, uh, I, you've got uh, another song that's about, uh, there's a great song that I heard on one of your albums about a battle. You'll have to remind me what this is. Uh, where the, the, the Irish pikemen uh, had barley in their yeah. uh, in their pockets, and, and they were fighting the English. Yeah. Uh, the English uh, <clears throat> uh, way, uh, strongly outnumbered them. They were slaughtered. Yeah. And what, what is the story about the barley that was in there? What, well, they me? say it was on Vinegar Hill, which was outside of Wexford. The, 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 the Battle of the Rising of 1798 was mostly around the southeastern portion of the country, right. County Wexford. Yeah. under a Catholic priest, Father Murphy. And uh, one of the famous battles was Vinegar Hill. And surrounding that area, all these men had, the Irishmen, had pikes. Right. And a pike was like a long spear with a blade that also came out like a fish hook. So you could pull a guy could down. Pull a guy, or you could pull a horse down. Sure, sure. I mean, but the Redcoats, and they were fighting what we know here as Revolutionary War here, the Redcoats, the same guys, same time, who had... Uh, you know, field artillery. Well, they were the, the most highly trained. Absolutely. You know, the tightest Absolutely. military in the world. And all we had was a band of rogues, so to sure, speak, sure. armed with pikes and whatever kind of weapons, pickaxes, big shovels, sticks. anything. Yeah, 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 big sticks is what so, they had. And all they had in their pockets was the barley. And yeah, the, story, yeah. the story goes that uh, they died, they were slaughtered, and they were buried where they lay. And for a hundred years longer, the barley grows every year. It's a fascinating story, too. Nurtured by the blood. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. by the blood and the That's earth. Right. That's there right. There it is. Yeah. There it is right there. And what is the name of that song? That, uh, do you... It's called Boule of Vogue. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. It's not actually on one of my albums, but oh, it could oh, I'm be. sorry. Okay. Oh, I mean, there's I, a lot I, I, of stuff you've probably seen maybe on YouTube. Maybe. Uh, right. There's yeah. a lot of stuff about you yeah. on YouTube. Uh, if you're interested uh -huh. in uh, seeing more of uh, Ken O'Malley's stuff, just look him up on on YouTube, yeah. Ken O'Malley. There's plenty of stuff there, and you'll spend hours listening to Ken O'Malley True. tell stories yeah. and, and play his guitar. A lot of my work is, I go to colleges and universities, or private concerts, and uh, talk about Irish history, just like we're doing right now, and sing songs from various periods, right up from the early, you know, medieval stuff, 16th century, on up to uh, modern 20th century. You know, you're the best history teacher ever. Because, uh, well, uh, because you're telling it through the music, through the art, you know, and, and it, it just, it's just wonderful stuff. I, I want to just sort of go through and, and just sort of name some of the other um, uh, songs that, 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 that you have in here that are, uh, uh, that are sort of based on, on uh, the Irish immigration, kind mm -hmm. of. Uh, Patty's Green. Great song. Right, great song. Uh, uh, it's an immigrant song. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a Red Rose. Uh, it, it, is, is that a love song? What, 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 uh, my Love is Like a Red Rose? Um, what, what, what was uh, I? There was some reason why I, I wrote that down. I don't know. Okay, that is a song that will be on my next album. It's by Robbie Burns. Yeah. One of the great Scots songwriters. Famous for his body songs, actually, and his pub songs. But he wrote Al Lang Syne that we sing every right, New Year's Eve. Right, that's right. That's where I but made But besides that, that one, I would say My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose. I just love that song. I love that song. And I have to say, I stole the arrangement from the Fury Brothers, one of Ireland's great traditional bands. Sure, sure. Just love the way they did it. Yeah, and, why not uh, steal from the best? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, mm. What are some of your other favorite songs? What do you... 
I don't um, know, what, what, uh, some of my other favorite songs? Yeah. My f- all-time favorite song is also on the first album, The White Seahorse, the opening track. It's called Carrick Fergus. Oh, I, it's a great song. It's a great song, and it talks about a man who's probably a little too fond of the drink, probably had way too much during his life, living somewhere at the far ends of the earth, be it America or Australia. Sure. And all he wants to do is come home to Ireland, the northeast of Ireland, outside Belfast, the village of Carrick Fergus, and spend his final days. Maybe looking it's for classic. him in a battle, huh? Yeah, I know, maybe, I know. Maybe, but it's, huh? I, every time I sing that song, it just it has a great deal of value to me personally. So you go around to colleges and you talk about yeah. Irish history mm-hmm. uh, and, and like that. Um, uh, you know, another song that uh, that that really uh, struck me, uh, uh, an immigrant's song, is Ryan's Lament. Mick Ryan's Lament, Mick written Ryan's, by a very good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it also has um, some uh, f- phrases from older songs that are that are uh, sort of traditional uh, military songs yep. and uh, uh, marching songs mm-hmm. and like that. Uh, tell tell us a little bit about uh, Mick Ryan's Lament and, and and what that song is all about. It's written by a dear friend of mine, Bob Dunlap, who lives on uh, Cape Cod. He's born and raised in South Boston. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Bob's a great, great songwriter. And it's a ghost story about two brothers who come from Ireland post-famine years, say the 1850s, yeah, and uh, forced to leave Ireland along with so many others. And they end up being shanghaied basically into the Union Army, as so many Irish were. Absolutely. They came off the ships, they were put in a blue uniform, sent down to fight in the South. Uh, as I understand it... Uh, Directly upon getting Landing. off, the, yeah. directly, yeah. literally uh, five steps away, Absolutely. They're, they're, they're signed on to the Union exactly. Army. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the story is, it's a ghost story. It talks about how one of them dies at the Battle of Vicksburg, yeah. and his brother then, Mick, goes on to survive the war and join up with General George Armstrong Custer and has his big day in the sun at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Ironic. Yeah. Now the melody Darkly of the song, ironic story. the melody of the song, which Bob slowed down to add a lot of drama, is called the Gary Owen, uh-huh. and that's a drinking song from the village of Gary Owen, outside of Limerick City. And Custer heard some of his troopers singing it one night, his Irish troopers. There was a lot of Irish in the Seventh Cavalry, absolutely. And he liked the melody so much that he adapted it for the regimental music. And uh, a friend of mine who's a retired Brigadier General of the 7th Cavalry told me that the music is still used by every cavalry regiment in the United States Armed Forces today. Now, it's that... So Bob slowed it down. Ah, my name is Mick Ryan. I'm lying still in a lonely spot near where I was killed by a red man defending his native land. In a place that they call Little Big Horn But I swear I did not see the irony When I rode with the serf and the cavalry We thought that we fought for the land of the free When we marched from Fort Leak in the morning And the band they played, the Gary Owen Brass was shining, flags are blowing I swear For me, brother, and me, we had barely escaped from the hell that was Ireland in '48. Two lonely young lads who had learned how to hate, but we loved the idea of America. And we cursed our cousins who fought and bled in their bloody coats of bloody red. Some never sets on the bloody dead of those who have chosen the empire. But we made a better life somehow in the land where no man has to bow. It seems right then and it seems right now. Paddy, he died for the union.
somehow got turned around For he'd stolen the dream that he thought he found Now I never will see that holy ground For I turned into something I hated And I'm haunted by the galleon Drums are beating to this country. I mean, we all fantasized about going to America, you know. Everybody does, right? In those days, I mean, it's not, I laugh when you think about 10 years ago, people in Ireland were going to New York for weekends shopping when the economy was just booming. It's not, it's, it's yeah, plummeted yeah. today. But you know, even back then, there's, a, there's an expression called the American wake that came about probably in the 1800s where people that left Ireland were waked. You know what a wake sure, is? Sure, sure. Somebody it's dies. Like a funeral. Well, it was the well, same thing. It is a funeral. Yeah. But it was the same thing because these people left for America and they were never going to be seen again. So never. they were. Yeah, yeah. So even 35, 30, 35 years ago, I mean, it wasn't... There was just nothing like the travel that we have today Absolutely. over the last 10 years. Yeah. You still were going to, we're 6,000 miles, it's a long way to go. And you might not ever come now, back. If you, went to New York, yeah. if you went to New York from Ireland, not unusual to go over a few times a year. California, you know, it's, going, it's like going to Australia. Right, right. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I got home once every couple, it was about the first, I was so homesick, I went home 10 months after I got here. Then it was about a year and a half, and then it started to get more and more longer periods going back. Right. Over the last seven or eight, nine years, I've gone back a lot more. Now, you go back every year yeah. with a... Uh, tour group. A tour group, yeah. right? Tell us a little bit about that, because I think people would be interested well, in what that is. Well, I wish I'd done it years ago, but I started about seven years ago, and then the, over the last five years... I've done three trips. I do it about once every 13 to 18 months. I'll take a group of about 30 to 40 people on a luxury coach tour, and I'll be the person on the bus as the guide. I don't want to take any more people so that they have Just my one bus. undivided Just attention. Just one bus full. Exactly. That's all you get. Right. And I entertain them every night, whether it be a formal engagement or just wherever the hotel we might be staying, and I'll pull out the guitar. And How I'll, good is I, that? I know. I customize the trips. So that I know where we're going, I know why we're going, I know what I want to show them. Sure. Culturally. And, and, and what, do, what do you like to show people? I'm going to show them what happened in Belfast, the troubles of the 60s. Great. The history behind it. And also, we have the Titanic. R which which was built? 100 years ago, built in Belfast. There's the new, huge Titanic Museum. And I'm going to take them That'll to that. Fun. I also want to take them to Neolithic megalithic, I should say, tombs of Newbridge in County Kildare outside of Dublin. Would they have burial 5, mounds? Yes, yeah, the burial yeah, yeah, mounds. Yeah. 5,000 years. Wow. Yeah, it's fabulous. Wow. So I'm taking them out there. I'd like to take them to Kilmainham Jail in Dublin where all the leaders of the rebellion of 1916 were executed. And wow. we'll do two days in Dublin, then go to Belfast, then go up to the Giant's Causeway, which is this hexagonal wonder of the world. It's oh, a really? huge tourist attraction. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, he, uh, Ken O'Malley just uh, yeah. recorded uh, an album about... Yeah, it, it's, it's called Forever Irish. Really. Yeah, And, and, and it's, it's a tailgating drinking songs for the University of Notre Dame. Fighting Irish. Go Irish. Fighting, fighting Irish. Irish. Go Notre Irish. Dame, yeah. Uh, uh, go Notre Dame. Yeah, exactly. Go Fighting Irish. This is Kelvin Hanyi. It's been a pleasure to talk to Ken O'Malley. This has been Creative Current on LARTstream.com. Thanks, Kelvin. It was a Thank pleasure. You so much.